Welcome to the Innovation in Compliance podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for our third book in our five-part series on Nick Gallo's 100 Book Challenge for 2020. Nick, of course, is a Chief Servant Officer at Compliance Line. So welcome back, Nick. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Today, we're going to take up the culture map by Aaron Meyer. So let me start off with asking you, Nick, why did you select this book? So I had just read The No Rules Rules, which she wrote along with Reed Hastings. I picked that book up reluctantly because I was like, I get it. But then I ended up loving the book. I love, I just love the whole, the whole thing. So I kind of became a fan of hers. And as I was looking at some of her other books, this one just kind of jumped out at me. I love culture. How do you hack it? How do you, how do you do culture better and navigate them better? That's an area that's super interesting to me. And so I looked at some reviews. There were some really high ranks, high ratings on it. And so I just jumped in. So I've also read this book and in our visiting before this podcast, it turns out we had really different takeaways from this book. So I'll start with mine and because yeah. I found yours really interesting and helpful as well. So what Meyer does in this book, or at least as I recall, is she looked at characteristics of cultures literally across the world. And she put together a Swedish Nordic culture, a Japanese Asian culture, a Middle Eastern Dubai culture, obviously Russia, Western Europe, Germany, the United Kingdom. Mexico, the United States. But I read it from a U.S. centric perspective that how does a chief compliance officer, or a compliance practitioner who works in a multinational organization who has to go deal with his or her colleagues literally in uh, countries across the globe, how do they communicate with him? How do they communicate effectively with him? How do you communicate without offending? How do you communicate with picking up the clues and, and signs. I think you said in an earlier podcast, you talked about poker with some degree of knowledge. So I'm going to assume you played poker before. <laughs> how do you how do you pick up a tell? What does a tell mean? Uh, right. And there are different tells. And those can be incredibly important in business meeting. It can be important in a regular meeting. It can be important when you're meeting with a senior leadership. It can be important when you're trying to close a deal. So how do you evaluate that information from the US-centric perspective? And when I wrote about this book, I wrote about the specific cultural, I don't want to say stereotypes, but the cultural norms she articulated in these various countries and the specific tactics a U.S. compliance practitioner could use or had to be aware of. But you took it, actually, you saw it in a little bit different light. So what was your kind of takeaway from this book? Yeah, so I thought that the way that she built this structure and this framework was, you know, genius. It was very accessible and relatable, right? We're seeing how these clusters of human beings who live in different geographical areas, what are the norms of the way that they interact with each other and how do those differ across, you know, different countries and cultures? That's kind of the premise here, right? But if you look at culture as just a set of beliefs and behaviors, period, then that definition can kind of span from massive groups, countries, on down to individuals. And what I saw as I was reading the book was that many of the challenges, the interpersonal challenges, or the the friction that happens within our culture here in Charlotte can be kind of attributed to these style differences from individuals. So she lists out like, I don't know, eight of these different criteria or these different axes of what makes up a culture. So one is communicating. So is it a low, a low context or high context culture? One is about evaluating. So do, you, do they give negative feedback directly or is it indirect? One is about leading. Is it more of an egalitarian style of leadership or is it a hierarchical style of leadership? What about deciding? How are decisions made? Is it a consensual decision where you get input from everybody or is it a more of a top-down, hey, I'm the boss, this is what we're doing uh, and so forth. Trusting, how is trust built in these different cultures? Is it built on task or is it built on relationship? Disagreements, are they, you know, are they confrontational disagreements or are they more conflict avoidant style disagreements? And then the last two are around scheduling and persuading. So persuading is persuading from a specific or from a holistic perspective. And scheduling is about linear time or flexible time. So again, I know that that was a lot, but the point is that maybe what light bulb turned it on for me 
was we hired somebody and my style is very egalitarian, very let's collaborate. We'll figure it out together. I don't have all the answers, but we together can figure them out. That's just my kind of style. And there was a, an anecdote in the book about an American manager who had to go and operate a plant in China. And he didn't want to wait in traffic and all that stuff. He was a very egalitarian guy. He wanted everyone to call him, you know, Nate or whatever his name was. And after a couple of weeks, he just found out he was wrecking his reputation. His employees hated him. His employees didn't respect him because in that culture, it's not egalitarian. It's a lot more hierarchical. So when they saw their boss riding to work on a bike, when all their friends' bosses were coming in cars, it made them feel worse about themselves. And I'm saying that anecdote triggered in me an experience that I was going through with a former teammate where my style, my egalitarian style, my more collaborative style, it really grated against him. So he would always call me Mr. Mr. Gallo. Like, you don't have to call me Miss. You know what I'm saying? So like, I was seeing some of these cultural differences that were being described in the book played out in my own life, in my, in our company here. And I was starting to then see, I was starting to make, make the connections on some of these other things about how people give feedback and how some people get so upset when you're a couple minutes late to a meeting, other people, Hey, I'm going to get to that meeting and we're going to be there for most of it. So these things that are greatly exaggerated, these cultural characteristics that are greatly exaggerated on a national level, we see nuances of, or sort of shadows of on an individual level. And I think tuning into these different spectra and opening your mind to them can allow you to be a little bit more effective. So if I'm working with someone in the future and they need to call me Mr. Gallo, well, then that, that's fine. I can cue in to say like, okay, this person's not comfortable with a collaborative style approach where they're part of the decision-making process. They really need me to just tell them what to do. Okay, fine. Well, then I can sort of do my situational leadership and give them what they need more quickly. But yes, this really resonated with me on the micro level because just navigating these cultures and kind of coming up with these personality tests for groups of people are on the one hand, very interesting and also present like a massive opportunity if you can dial it in and get it, get more effective at sort of navigating it, you know? That's really interesting because I'm the son of a professor and anyone I meet with a PhD, I automatically call them doctor. No matter how old they are, they're going to be 30 years younger than me and they're doctor so-and-so. And And that's just my default mechanism because right. all my life I was around professors and you called them doc. But you're able to use that cue to clue in yourself as to, okay, here's what I need to do with this person. Here's yeah. what I wanted to ask you about this book, because this is the one that struck me, perhaps, at least in my mind, the most applicable to compliance line, because you guys do hotline work. Mm-hmm. And are you able, or were you able to see some of the problems people have around speaking up, raising their hand in this book? And have you been able to maybe incorporate some of these points to help your clients understand this is why people aren't using the hotline? Uh, Now, it certainly could be a cultural issue, but it could also be an individual employee issue. Yeah, that's a great point. So there was actually a case kind of toward maybe Q3, toward the end of Q3. It was a new client and they were just kind of trying to figure, you know, they just spun up a line and it was somewhere in Asia. but they were just wondering why their numbers were so different. And so we were able to kind of talk about some of those cultural differences because in some of these places, to your point, they're not going to speak up as readily. Like these cultural differences, they not only happen sort of across the world, they also happen across ages, right? So a millennial or a Gen Z may go into the CEO's office on day one and tell them, I think our social media stinks, right? That's a, that's a cultural violation for another generation, right? So just tuning into those things and recognizing that there are these differences and that there's not one brush that you can paint the whole world with can help open people's minds to some of the different unique dynamics they might be facing in these different jurisdictions. Well, Nick, unfortunately, we're up near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope our listeners will join us tomorrow where we take up yet another one of my favorites, The Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson, and, and why I think this is the book that every compliance practitioner needs to read. So I look 100%. forward to continuing the conversation. Me too. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.